Okay, that's the sweetest start I've ever gotten for a talk. <laughs> Normally there's just silence in the beginning and you walk on the stage and you don't see people and you're like, okay, I'm just gonna talk to this silent void. Uh, this is way nicer, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk about challenges in the design process for VR, AR, MR projects. Um, and uh, I got already introduced, so I could actually skip this slide. Uh, but there is something important on that slide that wasn't part before. Uh, so I'm a UX lead and co-founder. I'm a nerd for emerging technologies, but I'm not a VR or MR or AR expert. I work in a studio where we create technical solutions for all kind of uh, challenges for tech companies. And uh, we've started looking at MR and all the different diversions of it as one potential solutions to our users, uh, to our clients' needs, basically. So this is not an expert talk. Um, who here works regularly, so daily with VR, AR, and that's their main? Yes, this one's not for you. <laughs> Great. Uh, who else has dabbled and played a little bit with it, like had a pet project or something at work? OK, cool. And everyone else is? has tried a VR goggle already, or like a headset? Okay, cool, good, no? Great, I'm relieved. <laughs> um, so yeah, this, this talk will be out from, uh, from the perspective of design professionals who wanna use this as one additional tool in their toolbox without necessarily getting into the digs and deeps of Unity and everything, and um, I'll be talking about a couple of projects that can be defined as mixed realities uh, that we had in the last years and use them as examples for the challenges and the issues that we've encountered while using them. Um, the first one is a MR fashion piece. Uh, it's a rework hoodie. It uses an antenna to pick up magnetic uh, activity around you and translates that into a sound sphere that you play in your hood while walking around. So it basically extends the reality on a location basis through an additional virtual layer um, while translating an auditive experience. This one would fall definitely under MR. Um, this one is a game that we are currently working, uh, working on. It's a uh, mobile game about space exploration. Um, and we are currently looking into also translating that into a VR experience. Pretty straightforward. Uh, TAG is a social AR app that we've been working on since last summer, uh, developing the concept and the prototypes for it and testing it. And the idea behind it is to enable a social experience using AR and actually making use of the context of the environmental makeup of your surroundings, basically, and create situational important or interesting experiences that you can share with each other. Like, think street art in AR on Instagram, kind of. Uh, so that would be mobile AR. And then we have uh, Free Drum, which is a virtual drum kit that fits in your pocket. Uh, it's a sensor that tracks your movement and creates a virtual drum kit in front of you so that you can basically air drum wherever you go. Falls also under the MR category. However, we've dabbled with putting this into VR. So uh, these will pop up throughout the talk, just so you know. Um, and I would start with a little bit of an overview where MR, VR, AR is at the moment. Um, I hope everybody of you is familiar with the Gartner hype cycle uh, that splits emerging technologies into the states, uh, stages of their development. There, it starts with an innovation trigger and then new technologies get hyped and everybody gets excited about it and there's lots of media coverage and everybody thinks like, oh, brave new world. And then people start to actually adopt it and realize ooh, there are actually quite some issues putting this into the real world when you want to make it useful. And then there is a trot of delusionment where people start to abandon the technology because they think, no, this is useless. It actually doesn't work. And then slowly there's progress, slowly there's technical uh, improvement, and uh, things actually start to work. Things to work. And not, it's not just the early adopters that are actually using this technology as a solution, but everybody. 
And if we, when we look at it, virtual reality last year was supposed to be on, already on the slope of enlightenment. So people start adapting it. That's not just really tech savvy uh, adapters. And augmented reality is like deep, deep in the pit right now, not working. But if we look at uh, 2018, virtual reality has disappeared. So everybody should be happy and know exactly what to do with it and have experienced it. So all of you are in an uh, animality that you've not tried it out yet. And, uh, but augmented reality hasn't actually moved anywhere and mixed reality is actually going downhill. So there are lots and lots of challenges still coming up. And why is that? Um, when we look at the market, actually the, uh, the amount of money that is spent on the consumer market is increasing rapidly. The amounts of devices that are shipped, both for AR and VR, are uh, increasing immensely. Um, what's hindering mass adoption? Uh, when looking at the report from Perkins and Cole for the state of VR in 2018, people are not happy with the UX. People are not happy with the content. So there you have it. Why won't people, users, mass adapt VR and AR? Well, it's pretty simple. Before you can, people have things uh, use on a big scale, you need designers designing for it on a big scale. And we actually don't have a lot of designers who know how to do that. There are not a lot of UX designers that in their general toolkit would think of VR or AR or MR as a solution to problems that they would fall into, like they would fall into of saying, let's create a mobile app. Let's create a voice assistant or something. It's just not as accessible. Um, and that's a problem. And I really, really hope that's going to change. But um, until it does, here are some of our experiences <laughs> and the things that if you want to get your feet wet with that, that you might want to brace yourself with, that you want to encounter those as well. Um, so with all that, now what? I'm a UX designer, so I'm not thinking about how do I bring this in Unity? I actually have like three main questions that guide my process. That's what are we designing? What's the right thing to design? Who are we designing it for? And how are we designing it the right way? And for each of these three questions, there are tools that we normally use, like market and trend evaluation, user research, and prototyping and testing um, in order to find the answers that we need. So far, so good, except that each single one of them when designing for VR or AR is really hard. Um, so let's go through the, all these three questions and the insight we have so far. When we start with designing the right thing, we need to identify a goal. And that's actually already where it comes mushy because a lot of people talk about, ah, oh, let's create an MR app, let's create an AR thing, and mesh things together that do not belong together in a certain sense, from an experience point of view. If you look at these beautiful quadrants, you can more or less divide four categories of applications. Um, you have things that are interactive versus things that are observing. If you have a VR documentary that is observing, you're not, the user's not interacting with the content, they're not actually affecting it in anything. They're taking everything in, whereas, um, for example, when uh, for the product Freedrum, for the kit, that only makes sense when you actually create something in your virtual world, in the virtual layer. You are interacting with the experience. Tag as well, it only makes sense when you s once you start creating content. So you can't just observe. And then there is a layer of augmenting and extending. That's This one is pretty straightforward. This one's maybe a little bit more difficult. Um, when you augment uh, in AR or VR, you create a representation of something that already exists. When you think of the general AR use case of overlying traffic information on your car screen, just putting that out there, that's augmenting. It's not creating anything new to create a new experience. Um, when we talk about the reverb hoodie that actually takes in electromagnetic activity and translates that, it creates a new sense for the person who's wearing it. It's like a perceptual extension. And in that way, it actually extends the experience into something that wasn't there before. It was not that the uh, information is just shown in a different way. It wasn't there or accessible beforehand. 
And that's the same for like for tag example because you create new things. So once you differentiate it, it becomes a little bit easier to understand what kind of challenges you are actually dealing with. Um, and when we generally talk about VR and AR, it has this added layer of complexity. It's just a big puzzle of body and space that's new when we normally design for a screen. And uh, that, well, this one is a selfie use case, but it just as well works for a Pokemon Go. If you don't actually uh, check the environment and the space that you're designing for, uh, you invite accidents. Um, I Do you know the Tilt Brush application? Have you looked at it? Um, so watching this video, it's an amazing video. It looks great. Um, you see this artist in her office and she puts on this randomly placed VR headset and she starts being creative and the moment she puts it on, the entire office disappears, which it of course op actually doesn't. The office is still there, the table is still there. This video creates the impression of a non-space suddenly existing because you put on VR goggles, which is not the case, right? So uh, we need to take that into account when actually designing for a new virtual element that there is still space that we're taking out of the perception that we still need to account for in order to create a good experience. So one anecdote that I actually, that I didn't manage to put in this, uh, in this presentation that I just realized before, um, I went to Tokyo a few months of, uh, ago and they have this big VR center in Shibuya where they have three floors of just different VR games. And it's lots of fun. It's really good. They have some of the best VR games there. None of them actually includes you moving. Or no, that's not wrong, uh, not right. Two of them include moving out of the 500 that they have. All the rest are stationary. You stand like that. So, and then you shoot aliens and you sit in your racing car or whatever. But the aspect of actually moving through space is uh, removed because of this existence of the non-space around you at that moment. Um, okay, great. Yes. Um, and that's all nice. You could run into a table that hurts, but it's not just creating this non-space around you when you're dealing for, uh, with VR. It's also that you are creating the perception of a physical space. No, that's wrong. Um, that can go very wrong. Like this billiard game where he aims for the six, and he doesn't, he doesn't manage to hit it, obviously, because it's not there. But in this sense, there is a perception created of a space that doesn't exist. So it's not just a non-space, it's a negative space. Um, okay, if we now move that further into AR, why are you not moving? Sorry, I'm looking for the mouse. If we now move this into AR, this is a, a Super Mario game that someone put into AR, which I think is very impressive. Um, and as you can see, it looks really, really good. But as he runs through it, there's absolutely no connection to the environment around him. There is no connection to the trees. There is no connection to the, to the ground. There is no connection to everybody else around him. So the only question, why did he not put it into VR so that he can at least block out the noise that's going around them, would be, well, so that he is aware around his surroundings as an intruding factor, which I wonder, is that really a good experience to have? Because they basically, he basically creates the need to be aware of two things at once. That's not very immersive. And to some extent, that's the experience that you're after when you create these kind of mixed realities, an immersive experience. But that kind of treatment kind of breaks it. Okay. Mm. So that means you need to find the fitting context and a fitting format for the project or for the experience that you want to create. 
when we started with the idea of tag, we wanted to make very, very sure that this experience connects both the physical and the virtual world. And that that connection is not just there because out of necessity, but that it actually brings an added benefit and a value to the entire thing, which of course means that the experience is created might be very short lived because the physical context is only there briefly, but it does leverage all the natural affordances of the situation that the user is in. Um, another a project where we tried that was the free drum. So as I said, it's sensors that you uh, slip on drumsticks. And my colleague actually has a set here if you want to try it afterwards. Uh, it's really fun. You don't need to have a drum. Uh, you don't need to know how to drum. And then you can still drum. Um, and in the beginning, it was just the sticks. And people would drum in the air. And it was fun. Um, but then we thought, OK, it would be nice to have an app for some visual guidance so it's not just sound feedback for people to orientate themselves where the drums actually are. We created an app that worked. Yay, we have a 3D drum kit. We tried other uh, VR drum kits, and they are not very satisfying because they rely on the, um, on the feedback for both sound and visuals on the same sensor, which puts a lot of rendering effort into the engine, and that creates lagging. And that's really weird when you're just hitting somewhere and stuff is just lagging behind in the physical uh, feedback, especially for something that's as reactive as drumming. Uh, so we thought we can do that better because we've already solved the audio part uh, of, this, of this experience. We already have a really, really good audio feedback where there's no latency whatsoever. We can do this better. We can just put this into a Samsung Gear. Great. And we did. It wasn't actually that hard, except that it didn't work at all. <laughs> um, because people can't see their hands. And once you see this disembodied drum kit, and you see it react, but you don't see your own hands, there is a huge disconnect between your own reality and what you are seeing, even though the feedback, the visuals, the auditive might be right, but your body just disappeared. So. It's not just, in that case, it's not a non-space, it's a non-body, basically. Um, so finding the right format for your experience is, is tricky, difficult, but extremely important and very underestimated. Would we just see the drumsticks? No, no. You would basically just see the, uh, the hit areas. And probably we, would sol we can solve that if we put more effort into it. But it's not our focus right now. It was this, hey, we can put this in VR, right? <sighs> um, second question, are we designing for the right people? Um, there are two main challenges. Uh, one is um, perception and bias. VR and AR both are uh, interfaces that are processed much more, much faster cognitively and much more immersive because they address multiple sensors. That also means they are far more uh, vulnerable to an uncanny valley effect, where slight lagging behind, where slight misalignment of reaction causes VR sickness or just general unpleasantness in the experience because they're. Uh, because the the possibility for a cognitive disconnect is just so much bigger. If you have a lagging button, okay, fine, you can deal with that. But if you start hitting things and they don't react quickly enough, it's not the same thing. Um, so while testing for that, um, it can be really frustrating because people are also different. There's different physiognomy and our heads, our eyes are different. And we had one very unpleasant experience where we just didn't, I had a very unpleasant experience where something was not calibrated correctly. And after two minutes, I felt so sick. And that ruined the extra, uh, entire experience for me. And that was not because the designers did a bad job. It was just because the translation between my brain and the virtual reality was not good enough. And it just requires such a high level of perfection and that recreation, basically, that it's difficult to actually judge the experience if there is a slight offset. Um, so that is challenge one. But you can test it, right? People will tell you if it sucks or not. 
except if they don't. Because um, while testing mainly the tag application, uh, there we encountered something like conformative opinion. VR and AR has been around so much that people have an opinion about it. And there are people who think it's amazing, there are people who think it's not amazing. The people who think it's amazing, they're very, very enthusiastic about it. And they will forgive you almost everything. Like, it's not really aligned. It's fine. I can see the potential. Uh, this will be great. Which really doesn't give you a whole lot when you're user testing. Because they are not actually giving you the answers you need. On the other hand, people who say uh, that had a bad experience, like my VR sickness, are much more um, prone to discover those small misalignments again and say, no, this doesn't work. It's a nice idea, but it just doesn't work. And block it off much faster. Again, makes interviewing for user testing way harder and asking the right questions. And then there are some ethical implications. It's just a slide. Uh, one page, and I'm not going to go into too many details because that's a huge topic that you could open up and probably give an entire talk in itself. I just wanted to put it up as well. Um, for a long while, especially VR has been hyped as the empathy machine, um, putting yourself into someone else's shoes, being able to reproduce an experience, uh, which now that slowly there are studies rolling out, um, actually doesn't work really well and that totally makes sense you can put people in a vr experience and put them into a wheelchair and you can get people who are awesome with that you can also get people who say oh this wasn't so hard so why is it so hard for other people and you get the entirely opposite reaction of the empathy experience that you actually want to have that doesn't benefit the people that you actually wanted to benefit on the other hand, you can get people that are extremely frustrated with that experience and say, this is horrible. I can't do anything. So I conclude from that, then people who are always in this situation also can't do anything. They're also completely impacted. And they're completely devaluing the skill set of people who are living with this situation every day. So either way, uh, it's not the result you wanted. Not to say that that potential is not there, but it's important when creating these kinds of immersive experiences and wanting to use them for something that extends empathy or that broadens your mindset with a new experience, takes you to another place, to make sure that you're providing an experience that does not entitle people to, have, to make an opinion that they're actually not entitled to make. Because just because you put a body into a certain kind of space, you're not recre recreating an experience. Okay, so short, ethical, but back. <laughs> um, are we designing things the right way? So now it becomes a little bit more detailed in terms of, okay, where does stuff actually go when, when we start designing things? Um, challenge number one, it's the 360 degree interface. When we design for a phone or for a website, we are limited by the frames of a screen they give us guidance. Designers love frames and stuff because that gives us just more freedom. Whereas when we start to design for 360 degrees, we are not limited, except we are, of course, because we're not limited by a screen. We're limited by the viewport, by the ability to move, uh, by the ability to focus uh, of our users to focus on one thing and to reach certain areas comfortably while glancing. Um, and we've discovered that it's actually pretty difficult to come up with paradigms. It's like, glance is always great, or tapping is much better than glancing uh, for VR or MR. It's hard to come up with paradigms because the control paradigms do not follow the medium, they follow the context. And because the contexts are so much broader, you basically need to recreate your rules for the interface every time again. So basically what I'm saying, I have no tips for you. <laughs> um, ground your input and output channels. Uh, when we design for something, we norm or when we experience anything, our eyes are the main channel how we 
process things and understand things and input things basically into our brain. When we use glance and looking into a direction, we're doubling down on that as an output channel as well. Um, that creates a cognitive load because we need a mental switch from, oh, this is not unintentionally exploring, this is now intentional communication. Um, same happens when you actually use sound and then voice control. <laughs> um, so a good clarification between what is it that the user does to understand the experience and what is it that the user does to communicate with the experience <laughs> is important to make clear before and to understand that in the context that you're putting the user in. And then the, thing, uh, the third one, differentiate between overlaid and embedded context, kind of goes back to uh, the augmented versus extended uh, parallels, basically. When you create, uh, when you put embedded UI content um, or UI element, you should make sure that the place where it is actually creates a context for the activity. So basically, embedded UI contact that's relevant to the location where it's placed um, is an action that is somewhat rooted in that place. When you have overlaid UI content, that's a control that's not actually relevant to the location or the place where you are as a user. And then, of course, physiognomy. Um, you can probably bust me on that. <laughs> but where to actually look, um, and that really benefits from a lot of testing. Um, because we are still limited by where a user can comfortably look and move to. While we're, we're testing tag, and as I said, we wanted to make sure that the content created is relevant to the location where it's placed. So, of course, a person that finds a new tag that's into a context can't just keep on walking like that. They need to stay. And while testing that out and placing tags around and having people try it out, we realized people started to do this, it seems like a very small thing, but they started to twist their phones to be able to see the tag in the context that it really was and get it right. And now that's a social app, so there's some texting involved. Is our user supposed to start texting like this? That doesn't work. It's not, it's not the, the positioning of the medium that you're using or the position that you're in in order to control something. If you have a VR experience and to control, you need to do like this because up there is something that needs, brings you up, I don't know, transports you somewhere. And you need to look at it for three seconds before you get over, but then there's another level and you have to do it again and again and again. It's not a feasible interaction. It's not nice. You can't redo that for multiple times. So you need to check the interaction paradigms that you have, that they're actually repeatable in a physiognomical, okay position. Otherwise, we end up with something like that. And I couldn't find it with another phone, but you get the idea. People start to do funny stuff in order to achieve their goals when they're, once they are in an experience. Um, okay, are we designing things the right way? Uh, still, testing and prototyping. So to answer all of these questions, as you've seen, we've done a lot of testing and just trying things out. The issue is that as designers, we're used to have, okay, um, tools like Sketch, Extra, uh, lots of sketching applications that just make this whole flow very easy and they just don't exist for anything that's in MR uh, and VR AR. So you have, what you get is either overly simplistic concept development sketches uh, for, the, uh, for the planet game. We started building a 3D stage that we use the phone to navigate around to see like, ah, mate, does that make sense if the phone moves like this and the plane moves like this and stuff? It works, it, it gets a feel across, but, or you actually have to dive in and start building high fidelity technical prototypes. There's not really a way around that, unfortunately. Uh, so you better be sure what you want to do is really what you want to do and be totally fine with failing the first five to 10 times. Um, and 
once you got there, once you actually created something that's fun and that people can use for longer than two minutes, for longer than five minutes, um, it's actually really, really hard to test adoption for longer time. It's really hard to transport a lot of hardware like VR or something. The portability is low. The threshold is very high to use it. So after going all of the, through all of that, the nicest experience is like, yeah, I did it, but I'm not sure anyone's ever going to use it. <laughs> okay, conclusions. <laughs> um, for the, to address the three questions again, in terms of what is it that we should design, prepare for a lot of communications about the, uh, about the concept, to get some visuals quickly to communicate what you're after, and try to play activities, maybe as a role play, with very simple props or with no props whatsoever, so that you can figure out that if you want to do this, it's not a good idea without the actual billiard table, because you're going to fall over. Um, when you want to figure out who you're designing for, make sure you're asking the right questions and not are just asking for the things that you want to hear and try to figure out what is behind those answers that you're getting when testing those experiences. Pretty common, I guess. Uh, how to do the right things after communicating your concepts as low-fi as possible, build hi-fi as fast as you can and test as often as you can. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>